Okay, welcome everyone. I'm going to start us today. I'm delighted to welcome everyone. My name is Ross Upshur. I'm a professor at the Dalai Lama School of Public Health in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. And it's a great pleasure and honor to be the uh, uh, moderator today on the topic of governance, ethics, and the ACT Accelerator. So the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator is a global collaborative effort to accelerate the development, production, and equitable access to COVID-19 tests, therapies, and vaccines, the latter being pursued through the, its COVAX pillar. Key to accomplishing its mission is establishing which organizations are playing which roles in Act A decision-making and ensuring that such decision-making is informed by a robust ethical uh, framework. Uh, this seminar is going to explore some of these challenges and opportunities related to the governance and ethics of the ACT Accelerator. And we're really fortunate to have three uh, exceptionally uh, capable and expert uh, uh, panelists today. So I'm going to introduce the panelists and I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about the logistics. I think that's just been put in. Please use the Q&A function to uh, uh, um, uh, put your questions to the panelists. And if you see a question you, you like or you want to see advance, press the like function because that will uh, upgrade it to my attention. And uh, also use the chat function to introduce yourself and where you're from, because it truly is a global forum and we'd like to know where everybody is from. So our three panelists today are and the order that I'll introduce them in the order that they're going to speak and then I'll hand it over to them. So our first speaker will be uh, Dr. Owen Schaefer, who's a, an associate uh, professor at the National University of Singapore's Center for Biomedical Ethics and is currently the director of the Phase Two Ethics, Law and Professionalism uh, curriculum. Uh, Owen has spent uh, two years prior to this at the Department of Bioethics at the National Institutes of Health in the United States as a pre-doctoral fellow, then went on to read for his BPhil and DPhil degrees in philosophy at Oxford. And he spent a year as a postdoc at the Oxford Center for uh, Neuroethics. Uh, uh, Owen's research interests cover ethical issues raised by the development of novel biotechnologies. And uh, that's, I think, uh, uh, suitable for this topic for sure. Our second speaker will be Professor Surya Moon, who is the uh, co-director of the Global Health Center and professor of practice for interdisciplinary programs and international relations uh, at the uh, Graduate Institute of Geneva in Switzerland. Her work is concerned with the intersection of global governance and public health, and she has made theoretical contributions to the field, which include conceptualizing the global health system, defining the functions the system must perform to adequately protect public health and global public goods for health, and identifying the types of governance gaps and power disparities that contribute to health inequity. She's developed specialized policy expertise on how to achieve more globally equitable innovation and access to medicine and help strengthen the global governance of outbreak preparedness and response. And her current research focuses on the international sharing of outbreak prone pathogens and related benefits and new business models for pharmaceutical R&D. So obviously germane to the topics we're gonna to discuss today. And last but by no means least is Katie Kidd Wright and she's the director of Global Fund Advocates Network. Uh, she is also the co-lead for the platform for communities and civil society representatives to the ACT A, uh, which was set up with representatives from Stop AIDS and WACI Health in 2020 to coordinate and demand CSO engagement. Prior to this, she spent close to a decade working for Canadian parliamentarians in various roles at the House of Commons, working on automotive policy, telecommunications, human rights, and patent regulations. Katie has also worked for Results Canada, where as the director of campaigns, she led efforts on all the global health and poverty related campaigns, including vaccines, microcredit, and education for all. So as you can see, we have three extremely dynamic uh, uh, panelists who are well poised to illuminate these issues. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Owen to open the proceedings. Owen, over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, I should just say, uh, yeah, thanks for the motion there. I, I'm an assistant professor rather than associate professor, um, but otherwise, yeah, thanks uh, for that introduction. So I'll, I'll be giving a, a, a hopefully a brief overview of some of the, the main governance principles that seem to underpin many ACT accelerator activities. Um, and this hopefully led the groundwork for um, Siri and Katie's further discussion. Uh, so Ross already uh, gave a bit of uh, overview of what the ACT Accelerator is. Um, and in fact, they're actually, they produced a document in April 2021, a very useful document. And I'll just draw a few items from there, uh, especially for folks that aren't as familiar with the ACT Accelerator, although I think many will be uh, familiar with at least the COVAX pillar of it. 
Right, so as, as Ross uh, highlighted, um, it was designed to rapidly um, leverage existing global public health infrastructure to develop, develop produce, and, permit, and um, promote access to uh, these tests and treatments and vaccines for COVID-19. And so that, that kind of translated into these three pillars. So vaccines, which is, and that's the COVAX pillar, but also the diagnostics and therapeutics um, pillars uh, for again, development um, uh, and, and, and distribution of, uh, of these interventions. There's also two kind of cross-cutting uh, work streams that the ACT Accelerator um, has been um, uh, uh, um, developing, and that's one is a health systems connector, given that um, health systems are needed uh, to deliver vaccines, that uh, diagnostics and therape therapeutics, that uh, cord connector is meant to um, help uh, facilitate those health systems to deploy those tools. And then uh, there was also an act and access and allocation work stream, uh, given many of these, um, uh, particularly vaccines and, and now therapeutics are scarce. Um, so access and allocation is necessary to ensure equitable distribution. Okay, so the ACT Accelerator um, is a, a unique, unique sort of structure, and Siri will get in a bit more about how unique it is. Um, but it is, uh, it does involve uh, several co-convening entities, right? Um, various NGOs, and other entities, right? Uh, and so you have uh, WHO, Gavi, CEPI, UNICEF, UNITAID, Welcome Trust, World, uh, World Bank, Global Fund, and Find, right? And they, uh, they kind of uh, different uh, subsets of those co-lead different pillars. Uh, they co-convene those pillars. And what sort of the governance structure that they settled on, well, it's interesting because uh, ostensibly there isn't a governance structure, right? So, so if you look at this, uh, the ACT-A kind of um, about document, um, it says it's, it's a collaborative and coordinated effort, but not a new legal entity or decision-making entity. Uh, time bound, so given the you know, COVID-19 pandemic, um, with the explicit intent, I bolded the bolds are my emphasis, not from the original, original document, but the explicit intention um, was not to develop new governance mechanisms. Uh, instead, formal governance is meant to devolve to each of the pillars and particularly each of those kind of um, uh, co-conveners I just mentioned of those pillars, right? So entities like Gavi, Find and so forth, um, WHO, they already have their own internal governance structures. So from these documents, um, and this is like the only real governance statement in that, um, in that, uh, what is the uh, ACT Accelerator document, right? It just kind of says, well, we're pushing the governance over to um, the boards and the governing bodies of these co-conveners. Um, so for the rest of this uh, brief few minutes, um, I'll say, well, uh, despite that, there is, it's clear that there is um, an appeal to various governance principles throughout various ACT A documents and outputs. Um, and I think that, 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 and then I'll kind of end this, uh, this intro with uh, how we synthesize uh, many of those into um, a, a framework um, and three particular governance principles uh, that uh, Assyria will get into uh, are important to, um, to promote and, uh, and realize in Act Accelerator. And those the four documents I'll just summarize quickly um, is this kind of early um, April, 2020 commitment and call to action, um, right when uh, Act Accelerator was being set up. Um, and, and then there was a, a February 20, 2021 civil society letter that kind of critiqued certain aspects of uh, Act Accelerator um, uh, processes up to that point. Uh, there was actually a personal uh, data uh, governance framework uh, produced by the uh, uh, within the diagnostics pillar uh, that had some governance principles. And finally, I'll look at uh, the fair allocation mechanism uh, um, through the COVAX facility and their sort of governance uh, principles as well. Before finally getting to this uh, the synthesis document at the end. Okay, so the commitment and call to action. This is a statement uh, made by several uh, of these co-convening entities, outlining sort of the this very brief document, but just outlining sort of uh, purpose of the Act Accelerator, what would become the Act Accelerator, um, and and these three, you know, they'll, they're they're going to recur: transparency, accounting, ability, and engagement. And you'll see towards the end, these are the three kind of that we picked up on uh, in our analyses um, in the WHO uh, Ethics and Governance uh, Working Group uh, for the Act Accelerator. Uh, and, and these three were already present in, in this initial uh, April 2020 statement, right? So this is the full um, uh, set of commitments, the five set of commitments um, uh, concerning the Act Accelerator. And you can see uh, from commitment two, uh, there is uh, an unprecedented uh, level of partnership and they're proactively committed to engaging stakeholders. You see the value of engagement there. Um, and then it also talks about grounding partnership in transparency and science. So transparency uh, being uh, the second of those um, general governance principles. And looking down on number five, you also see this commitment to accountability. And here's interestingly, the scope of accountability there, um, it's both to the world uh, as a whole, to different communities and to one another, I guess, the one another being um, the different entities of the ACT Accelerator. So at the very beginning, um, there were these kind of uh, yeah, explicit appeals to um, broadly accepted governance values.
So uh, also in that civil society letter, which was um, uh, a letter of concern uh, relating to uh, certain um, issues that had been brought up relating to engagement um, of the Act Accelerator with civil society and community representatives. Um, and, and that letter, it's, it's publicly available on the internet. Um, uh, you, can, uh, you can find uh, the full text online. But you'll even see from the, the, the title of that letter, right? More transparency, accountability, and inclusion needed in Act A um, in February. Uh, and, and I should say that um, the ACTA has responded to this. Uh, maybe we'll get to a little bit later on on the extent to which um, uh, processes have have changed since then. But this is not. This is just to highlight that um, in that letter, even though this was independent of many, many of the other kind of uh, documents that were produced, um, those three governance principles really really came out uh, as matters of concern. Uh, also, uh, as, as mentioned, the ACT Accelerator's diagnostics uh, pillar had a framework for data governance, right? And they also had some substantive pr um, principles, but um, then they also had these three procedural principles, procedural, procedural principles referring to the sort of governance arrangements or the way that decisions are made, transparency, accountability, and engagement, um, the, the big three, so to speak, uh, being highlighted in that document. Uh, and finally, um, under the COVAX facilities uh, uh, 2020 um, uh, allocation mechanism uh, document, there was a section called governance considerations. And here, uh, the mapping is a little bit um, uh, not quite so tight to the three, but I think the three, the big three um, uh, can be seen from those considerations. So uh, concerns about representation were put in there, which is a little bit different, to be fair, from engagement. Um, so it's a bit different, um, but related in certain ways. Uh, there's a commitment to safeguarding the transparency um, in, in composition and funding of each of the structure of the governance mechanisms. Um, there's a, a commitment to having strong accountability mechanisms. Uh, and then again, relating to transparency, making public relevant inputs and decisions. Okay, so this is just to say that um, despite the sort of overarching statement about being a governance -less structure, uh, there are these governance principles that recur throughout the work of the Act A. And I think then it is fair to then, um, then think about how, how governance uh, as such of the Act A can be thought through and potentially improved. Uh, so, so this kind of uh, is a culmination of, of that analysis. Uh, so it, um, in July 2021, um, uh, the working group, uh, WHO Working Group on um, uh, Ethics and Governance for the Act Accelerator, um, we produced this kind of um, synthesis of these different frame, uh, values. Uh, the first part of the document, which I won't summarize here, was on the substantive values, the kind of normative um, considerations in making decisions, things like um, providing benefit to society, solidarity, uh, and fairness. But then again, the second part, the procedural or governance values um, were these big three that I mentioned before, transparency, participation, or participation and inclusion, I should say, and accountability. Um, yeah, so um, so I'll, I'll, I won't get too much into the weeds about um, the implications of that. I think Suri will, um, in her analysis, uh, go into more detail. But for now, just to highlight, yeah, transparency um, includes kind of the, the justification rationale behind decisions uh, and uh, communication, uh, of course, should be straightforward, honest, uh, made available to public review. Uh, participation and inclusion. It's always a question, of course, of which uh, relevant entities um, can and should be brought in. Uh, but we've seen uh, civil society and community organizations have been a particular um, set of stakeholders that uh, ACTA has been committed to from the beginning in terms of engaging. And finally, accountability. Um, yeah, this uh, challenge of, of determining, especially in the sort of um, uh, devolved governance structure, determining, um, uh, how, defining who is responsible for making decisions. And then of course, if there's a critique of those decisions, uh, who can be held to account um, uh, in those critiques. Okay, so I'm not gonna get into um, uh, more of those details about how to apply these. And I'm gonna now turn the time over to Suri uh, to uh, provide an analysis on that. So thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Owen. Suri, uh, you have the floor now and remind uh, people, our participants to put your questions in the q and I see a couple coming there, so keep them coming and we'll turn to them as soon as we've uh, finished. Thank you, Suri. Over to you, please. Thanks so much, uh, Ross. Let me just make sure. Um, can you see my slides okay? Yes, great, thanks. So thanks so much, uh, Ross, for the warm uh, welcome and introduction and um, to Owen for this very thorough um, background on the, the values framework and on the ACT Accelerator itself. Um, what I'm going to do is to present uh, an analysis of some of the governance challenges facing the uh, ACT Accelerator, uh, in particular, uh, when we applied the three values that um, Owen so nicely uh, explained to us, participation, transparency, and accountability. What you can see here on your screen is the, um, the authors on whose behalf I am uh, presenting this today. The article that explains our um, research and our analysis was just published hot off the press uh, last Friday night, uh, UK time. 
And at the end of my slides, you have to wait, you can see the open access link um, in which I will, uh, because I think if for, for some people it's behind a, a paywall. Um, so what I wanted to do was just to provide a little bit of background on, on how we approached this analysis. Um, uh, all of the authors you've seen on the previous slide are members of the WHO Working Group on Ethics and Governance of ACT A. Uh, we met weekly and we were discussing uh, on a regular basis the governance of the accelerator and uh, we found that we were quite often confused. It was actually quite difficult for us to understand how decisions were being made, who was making them, uh, and how that was changing. It was actually a moving, um, a moving target. And it became quite clear, actually, that this was one of the challenges uh, of an initiative which had been set up very quickly in the heat of a crisis um, to respond to a emergency in the first months of 2020. And I think this is understandable, certainly, for something that's set up uh, to respond in an emergency to an emergency. Um, but we, as we uh, continued in our analysis, it became clear that there are, there's room for improvement. Um, so what we did was we traced the evolution of the governance uh, and we relied on publicly available documents for the analysis. Um, and if you go to the Lancet website, you can see a uh, summary, I mean, not a summary, excuse me, a, um, a supplementary annex that has all of the, the data for any of you who are interested in, in digging further. Um, I would really encourage you to go and, and take a look there. We also did have uh, private conversations with a number of people who were directly involved in the ACT A, but we didn't rely on those for our uh, research or the analysis I'm, I'm presenting to you here. And I think that's important because indeed how the public understands ACT A is one of the big questions that we uh, we had. And it's one of the reasons we, we focused on publicly available documents. So using those we mapped and analyzed governance arrangements, not just what they look like, uh, but how they changed and then continue to change. Um, and I should say that changing governance arrangements are not a bad thing. You know, we, we uh, recognize that governance arrangements should be responsive to change. Uh, and the epidemic certainly has kept, uh, the pandemic has kept many of us guessing as to which direction it's going to head in. But at the same time, uh, an entity that was constructed quickly that changes constantly can raise a number of challenges for participants for transparency, for accountability. And the three challenges that we focus on are what I will, I will present to you next. Uh, so the first is that the, the roles of organizations and decision making uh, is unclear. And what this means is that it's very difficult to participate in a meaningful way if you don't know which organizations are uh, making which decisions. And it also makes it unclear who is actually going to be accountable for what. And I show you here a picture of our uh, mapping. Again, this is from the supplementary annex. And you can see um, it's, it's probably difficult to see some of the very small fonts. So I'll just point out here in the um, upper left, here's one example. Here's one of the many organizations uh, that's a co-convener in ACT A. This is Gabby. And if you see the different color dots outside, um, the color code is down here. You can see a number of their board members are from government. They're from the private sector. They're from academia. Um, they're individuals. They're charitable foundations multilateral organizations. And as you look across the landscape of ACT-A, you can see there are multiple, at least legal centers of decision-making power, which is the boards of each of these co-convening organizations. And it's a real mix of public and private. It's a real, um, it's crowded landscape with lots of different uh, formal centers of decision-making. And there is no one single place where they all come together. And in many ways, I think this diagram illustrates a number of the challenges that we identified. If you are uh, a a member of the public or an NGO or a journalist and you're trying to follow, or a government even, and you're trying to follow what is happening in ACTA, who's making decisions, you would have to navigate this extremely complex uh, landscape. And this makes participation uh, in our judgment quite difficult. As I mentioned before, the second challenge is the absence of a clear decision-making body. So there was not one circle in the middle in the previous uh, diagram. And because you have, again, multiple organizations involved, each of those organizations has its own approach to information transparency, which means that for ACT Day as a whole, information transparency is uneven. And some organizations don't have transparency policies at all. The absence of a clear decision-making body also makes it difficult to participate because there isn't 
one unified place where you can go to try to make your concerns heard if indeed you have them. What we also found, and you can see this in table two in the article, is that a number of the entities involved in ACT A actually play multiple roles at the same time. So you can see across the top, a number of the key organizations that are co-conveners or members of the principals group or co-founders, for example, you can see in each of the rows across the left-hand side, the different governing bodies for ACT-A that they participate in. And one thing that's clear is that you have certain players that are really involved uh, in multiple places. So here, let me highlight, for example, uh, the Gates Foundation or the Wellcome Trust. You can see they have uh, roles in almost every governing entity, um, which raised some important questions for us regarding an appropriate separation between oversight versus implementation. Um, for example. You can also see here on the right hand side that low and middle income country governments, so this is government, really only engage formally in one place and that's the facilitation council. Now one of the challenges is that the facilitation council is a purely advisory body. It's not an oversight uh, body. It's not an accountability um, body. It's supposed to advise and mobilize support for the, um, the ACT accelerator. And this really leads me to our third challenge, which is that we found that the role of governments in governance of Act A was receding to the point that it was indiscernible. And what this means is that there are significant questions that arise regarding what is the political legitimacy of the actors who are making the decisions within Act A. And it also raises questions around channels for public accountability. And here I want to emphasize that our argument is not that governments are perfect, not by any means, but generally, citizens or residents of a country are uh, are supposed to hold their own governments accountable and it's governments who are supposed to hold international uh, actors accountable for the decisions they make they're supposed to represent the interests of their people at the international level and so when you don't have a clear role for governments this whole chain of accountability from citizen to government to the international level that chain breaks down and this raises questions more broadly about accountability of the accelerator overall. You can see the evolution of the role of governments in this uh, um, snapshot. So here we have the diagram of how the act Day was conceived about a month after it was launched. This is from May 2020. You can see at the top here, a number of flags of governments, all high income country governments that acted largely as donors or funders um, of the act accelerator. And this is a picture of the accelerator as of April 2021, about one year later. Now, what you can see is that the flags have disappeared. And indeed, where governments uh, appear in the governance of Act A is indeed at the, in the Facilitation Council, which in this diagram sits at the top. But as I mentioned, the Facilitation Council actually does not have an oversight role. Uh, and, and, and it does not have a decision-making role, uh, I should say, within, uh, within the ACT accelerator. And so, in, in fact, here, um, the, the role is, uh, is really receding. So we developed a number of proposals for uh, short-term improvements in governance that we thought would strengthen the, the ACT Accelerator's uh, governance overall. First is to have a clearly described set of roles and responsibilities of each organization so we can understand more broadly um, who is making which decisions, what are the processes by which we do so. And I should mention that the ACT Day underwent an internal evaluation in uh, September of this year um, uh, run by Dahlberg Consulting and that they released a new strategy in October of this year. And they have taken a number of the um, uh, feedback comments that they got including from our group. Uh, they took those into account in their strategy, but we still feel that our proposals were not fully, uh, have not yet fully been taken on board and that they remain, um, they remain valid. The, the second recommendation is to adopt a common transparency policy across organizations, which could, for example, cover uh, at a minimum their Act A related activities. Um, the third is to create a regular forum for meaningful, broad based public debate on the entities, uh, the initiatives, activities, policies, decisions, achievements, and struggles, and that this would be a useful way of supplementing um, the board level governance that is currently the main sort of legal arena. Um, fourth is to create a uh, act a wide accountability framework that would specify who agrees to be held accountable uh, for what. And to our knowledge, this has not yet 
been developed. All of those recommendations are short term uh, and in our judgment are also partial. So we end with the longer term recommendation, which is that governments and other uh, stakeholders negotiate international rules and commit financing and design governance arrangements that in fact would take these three ethical values seriously and that would build participation, transparency, and accountability into any future efforts to ensure innovation and access to countermeasures for future pandemics. Uh, we would argue and conclude that ethical governance is part of pandemic preparedness. It's a part of pandemic preparedness that has been uh, relatively neglected to, to date, but it's something that we can address in the years to come. Uh, with that, here's the open access link. Uh, we welcome any comments um, that you may have on the analysis. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you, Suri. That was a breathtaking distillation of complexity into 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, last but by no means least, I'll hand over to Katie. Katie, please. Thank you very much. And it's it, it's actually great to be here with um, Professors Moon and Upshur today to discuss this. And it was so great to read that paper last week because frankly, it felt like it was putting into a consistent, uh, clear, cohesive format many of the things that we have struggled with as community and civil society representatives within the ACT Day for the last 18 months or so. Um, so just to be clear, I am representing my colleagues on the platform for civil society and community reps to the ACT Day, which includes 47 community and civil society reps across the various pillars and respective work streams and working groups. And currently we are co-led by three organizations, although we are currently trying to expand by two more. I say this because I want to be clear that we don't always necessarily agree in terms of that large number of people, but I'm trying to stay focused today on the types of things that we have said together in different ways through our engagements with ACT Day. Um, as CSOs and communities, we really have struggled <laughs> to understand decision making and accountability, which has made meaningful participation quite difficult. Um, you know, maybe perhaps as a backstory, before there even was a platform, there was a very loose group of people, um, including community and civil society governance representatives in those institutions that actually have transparent and at least inclusive of civil society and communities governance structures, like the Global Fund, Unitaid, Gavi, and the CSEM, which is the Civil Society Engagement Mechanism for UHC 2030. That sort of loose grouping ended up evolving into the platform, which was created to try and keep those two groups kind of speaking to each other, where we have governance reps within these co-lead agencies um, and where we have ACT Day reps um, within the different um, sort of parts of um, the various pillars and, and, and subgroups. Um, the existing, um, we moved forward with that and we started to try and get more engagement with affected communities and in particular long COVID colleagues, um, which has been a new, um, you know, from an advocacy perspective, a new and interesting sort of growth um, of individuals who joined us. We have basically since the very beginning, which for us was June of 2020, asked for mappings and clarity on the structures of decision making in ACT Day because it has been unclear from the start and it remains rather unclear despite you know, actually being fairly embedded compared to many. Um, and we didn't just get to sort of nicely ask for participation as communities and civil society reps and that everyone just kind of, you know, agreed to it. It literally took months to get representatives into COVAX and the Health Systems Connector, and it was at times rather adversarial and challenging. Where it was less challenging was organizations like uh, with the Diagnostics Pillar and the Therapeutics Pillar, where the co-lead organizations already had existing relationships with civil society and community representatives within their governance structures, and so they were much more open to that kind of approach or that kind of engagement and understood the value of the expertise that communities and civil society bring. One of the key things that I say um, to everyone is that there is no funding for the work that the civil society representatives do. They are all volunteers in the work that they do. And this is unusual for us because in those co-lead agencies where there have been long-standing delegations or clear governance roles for communities and civil society, there's also usually funding that goes alongside that for the performance of their governance roles. I'm not really sure how ethicists might feel about that in terms of getting your funding from the same place where you're meant to be maybe critiquing or providing different perspectives, but in any case, that is sort of a long-established practice um, within those agencies. And the reason I raise this is because we have raised so many times in the constructs of ACT Day that 
everything is rushed. Everything is last minute. It is literally not unusual. It would, let me say this this way, it would be unusual for us to have more than 48 hours to review a document and provide feedback. It is often a 24 hour turnaround, turnaround or end of business day kind of turnaround, which makes it almost impossible to actually engage in real sort of consultation or real kind of engagement with others. And so, and well, we have said this over and over and over again, the response that we typically get has been sort of like, well, this is what we all kind of deal with. We're all just doing our best. But this assumes that civil societies and communities and may be true of others like low and middle income country government officials too, can operate in the same way as dedicated multilateral staff members or donor government reps or even private sector staff members who may have literal vested interests in the outcomes of conversations. Um, and so we mentioned that just because it took quite a long time to get any funding and we do have funding to support the reps, but we still don't have funding for the reps themselves who remain volunteers in this. Um, our goal throughout the last, you know, sort of since June of 2020 has been to find meaningful ways we can contribute to the dialogue. We haven't been as concerned, let's say, about accountability and transparency from a um, structural sense, but we have been raising in many different ways the lack of the transparency and accountability that the paper um, that was published talked about, and there have been sort of other analyses of that as well. I still agree, I would say, and this is a very personal perspective, I still agree in principle with the spirit of the framework for collaboration as it was set up originally, it was urgent and necessary to do something. Um, like, for me, if we think about where we are with the conversations around the pandemic treaty, you know, the recent WHO, WHA special session means that we're extending that decision on that until 2024. I mean, I don't know if we'd be necessarily any better off if we had taken a step back and done some better governance and accountability work before we established Act Day, but I can't, we, we probably wouldn't be worse. Like, it's kind of, I'm not sure, <laughs> because it hasn't really done a lot in terms of um, our ability to get work done in a meaningful, inclusive, transparent, and collaborative way. Um, the set, the, the, the core principles, which I think Professor Moon and Professor Upshur both mentioned about participation, transparency, and accountability, you hear this a lot in the ACT Day conversations. We hear this from everyone who's involved, but I would say that there has been, for all of the co-leads, a failing grade on all of them. On effort, I think I would give some of the key parties anywhere from a B to an F, um, but that's definitely been a very difficult space to navigate because of some of the things that have been pointed out that have been lacking and that just haven't improved really um, since the very beginning. Um, I think I will just try to wrap up by just bringing you up to speed in terms of um, earlier this year, we called for in April of 2021, because we have written so many statements and so many letters and tried to influence the conversation in so many ways, we called for a number of the things that you'll find in the um, in the Lancet paper around transparency and priorities in priority setting, transparent access policies and practices, transparent agreements with third parties, publishing every agreement between implementing parties, transparent R&D and delivery. We need to know the full cost of R&D and manufacturing, what the public investments have been to support those, and what the decisions are around manufacturing capacity and selection of production facilities. If ACT Day is funding those things, which it often does in the diagnostics and therapeutics pillar, we should have full transparency on that. We need transparency of conflicts of interests. We feel that that is what underscores legitimacy, and we also believe that there should be an independent there should be an independent evaluation by an external body to assess its commitments to transparency accountability and meaningful engagement i think as was already mentioned over the summer a review started that was meant to inform the um, strategic renewal that took place just a month six weeks ago i think it was published our perspective on that review that took place was that it was narrow and that it did not question these core assumptions and for that we felt that the review was not fit for purpose in our comments to the review, we included the following, and I'm just gonna quote it directly. There is a lack of transparency and clear decision-making structures within Act Day and a complete absence of mechanisms or tools for accountability with an acute lack of meaningful inclusion of low and middle income country governments, CSOs, and the communities for whom equity is at risk at all levels of decision-making. 
the strategic review has come out and does have a lot more mentions of CSOs and others, but it is rather short on detail. We are working on cross cutting uh, a cross cutting policy on meaningful inclusion around civil society and communities, and we have led on calls that are finally getting some traction on specific sort of work pieces, I guess, to establish a test and treat strategy, for example. That said, it is a tough slog in there in those meetings and our reps have been working very hard and on their own time um, and it is not a particularly effective model for meaningful inclusion in our opinion. So I think I'll close my comments there. I hope I've added a little bit of like narrative um, to it and just to say that really welcomed the recommendations that we found in the paper, maybe have a few more thoughts on some of them and just look forward to the discussion today. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Katie. And I'll ask all of the uh, panelists to now open their uh, uh, cameras and uh, show their face. I'll do the same. Uh, and so we have a couple of questions, and I'm going to try to sort of uh, bring a thread across, which is uh, about the engagement of uh, low and middle income countries. And I'll start with uh, Owen, uh, because one of the, I think one of the questions is, uh, who were the people that came up with and how was the ethical framework uh, and the values? Uh, uh, um, where did they come from and how much uh, inclusion was there in that? And then I'll uh, turn that to Surrey and then to Katie about if they could speak to the uh, presence and inclusion of uh, broader communities from low and middle income countries in their deliberations. So Owen, first over to you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so the, the framework that um, uh, that we published from the uh, WHO working group that was uh, primarily de developed by that working group um, uh, convened by the WHO. Uh, it was meant though not to be sort of a, an invention of that working group, it was meant to be, as I said, a synthesis of the prior uh, prior organizations. Now that's a bit of a catch-22 because uh, the synthesis the synthesis was of documents primarily produced by the active accelerator or ancillary organizations. So yeah, you might say, well, look, if those uh, you know active accelerator um, organizations themselves were not sufficiently inclusive, then they are synthesizing uh, exclu exclusionary approaches, and I think that that would be a fair, a fair critique. That having been said, I do think that the uh, three uh, overarching governance values, transparency, uh, accountability, and engagement are con consonant um, with general governance principles that are widely accepted um, uh, across different contexts among different bodies. I, I thought when we saw the uh, civil society and community rep letter and it mentioned these three values and that was you know, kind of independent of our own work that we did, did feel validated um, that we had identified um, uh, valid principles and gov of governance that are indeed uh, held um, across different stakeholders. So I'll say that. Over. Thanks, Owen. Suri? Sorry, Ross. I got distracted by the chat. <laughs> the question. <laughs> Just about how uh, uh, engagement of uh, low and middle income countries uh, was part of the deliberations or uh, uh, the work that we uh, that the paper in okay. entailed. Thanks. I thought that was the question. <laughs> Just double checking. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I, I wanted to flag there are a couple of things I didn't mention in my initial presentation. And, and one is that, um, indeed, I was listening with great interest to uh, Katie Wright's comments, and uh, I, I didn't fully appreciate how hard it's been to sustain civil society um, engagement and representation. Uh, all of that said, what we have seen in, you know, in, in our mapping and in our analysis is that over time, civil society groups were increasingly, at least formally, represented or invited to participate. Uh, and I think you've given a lot of us a, you know, a clear picture of how challenging it remains, but at least there was that, that kind of um, progression over time. Uh, we also saw some increases in transparency over time. Um, what we did not see, interestingly, is an increase in LMIC government um, involvement Involvement, except, as I mentioned, in the Facilitation Council, the, the advisory body. And this is something that I, I find uh, is continuing to be you know, both puzzling and troubling, uh, because this is really, you know, at the end of the day, where the rubber meets the road and who is ultimately accountable for for the health of, of people in their territories, it's, it's national governments. And what we've seen in this pandemic is that national governments have done Many things they have exerted their muscle in many ways, you know, for better or for worse. And yet, what we see in the Act Accelerator is a very, very different kind of philosophy of governance in in many ways. And you can see that in those brightly um, colored dots, where you see this real um, melange, this real mix of public and private authority that makes it unclear ultimately at the end of the day who is 
accountable? Who is responsible? And, and we've seen, I think, frustration, certainly from some developing country governments who've spoken quite publicly and quite critically um, about ACT A. Uh, I think that they do feel excluded from, from decision making. And, and probably this is focused much more on the vaccine issue um, and on COVAX than, than other um, uh, parts of ACT A, in fairness. But uh, uh, in, in my experience, this level of public critique is unprecedented. I mean, I think this is a reflection of real frustration. Uh, and and I, I don't know um, how long it will take. I mean, what more can be done to make that uh, engagement um, more meaningful in the, in the months to come? Maybe if I can squeeze in one last comment, it's just to remind everyone, what is the scale of the initiative we're, we're looking at here? The uh, budget for the last year was almost 19 billion, 19 billion uh, US dollars. The ACT A um, request for next year is about 23 billion dollars. Uh, and of course, the scale of the needs is very large. But when we compare this, for example, to you know, WHO's, WHO's annual budget is now about three billion. You know, for the global fund and for Gavi, we're talking about you know in a normal year, uh, three, four, five billion. Unitaid less than a billion. And so the scale of this, in terms of the amount of public money, and this is all, by the way, majority public money, the scale of money that has been mobilized and is being spent through Act A dwarfs anything else in global health. And so I think this is something we have to really um, be willing to ask for better governance arrangements. This is not small piece that we're talking about. Great, thank you. Uh, sorry, Katie, if you would like to reflect, I think there's interest broadly in the audience about uh, the CSO uh, environment and how you uh, coordinate and uh, what the representation is from low and middle income countries. Oh. Yeah, so I mean, there's so much to, you know, there's kind of so much to say, to be perfectly honest. I really appreciated the framing um, in the Lancet paper around who is Act A accountable to, who is it meant to be accountable to. Um, and I think that that's really important to reflect on because in the beginning, we were quite clear that Act A was not meant to be the global COVID response, right? It was meant to be a partnership to accelerate access equitable access to tools that were created. It has, however, I think grown into something more than that. And that's sort of another one of its kind of evolutions that's really difficult to track how that happened. Um, but in terms of how we very specifically as communities and civil society reps have tried to engage um, with partners, particularly from lower and middle income countries is when I say communities and civil society representatives, those are very distinct sort of categories. And they have evolved as we have sort of built this ship <laughs> as we have been sailing, but um, for us, community representatives are people who are living in, in places um, where equitable access for them is a real concern, right? Which is very different than a lot of the civil society reps who traditionally might be from high income countries or living in places where that's equitable access isn't really the concern. And so within communities, it has been long COVID communities. So we do have some representatives who have um, lived with COVID and we try to bring those um, perspectives in. We have um, the community colleagues that we do have and we're trying to add community colleagues as co-leads um, to the platform, which has been challenging because we have no funding or very, very little to offer um, to groups that, you know, are really on the margins. Um, and um, so we are trying our best to have an open platform where we have a website, we have listserv, um, we've held numerous webinars, both global in scale, and we've also tried to target regionally. Um, we have partnered with COVAX leads, we have partnered with um, the diagnostics leads, we have partnered with the WHO on various sort of civil society briefings and consultations, we've partnered with others in the context of sort of the G7, G20 spaces, we've done everything we can, but it's a little bit like throwing jello at a wall to see what will stick. Sorry if that <laughs> if that kind of uh, imagery doesn't work for everyone, but um, it is challenging, right? Like it is very challenging to build a proper sort of consultative body when that doesn't exist, when there isn't actually a space for that, that we can, you know, sort of respond to or mimic within, within our roles um, as civil society communities. So we really welcome sort of the calls for that. I think the other thing is just to say like in terms of, 
in terms of the history, like it was right from day one that we were noting the lack of Elmix in in the documents, in the engagements, and in the conversations. And it's something that we've raised in so many ways and in so many different times. And you know, really credit in particular our facilitation council reps, Peter Owidi and FIFA Rahman, who have raised this, including last week at the facilitation council, which if you don't know, those meetings are always live streamed. Um, so you can watch them live if that's of interest to you. And it's at least a place to start in terms of understanding the dynamics of some of those conversations. And there there has been some movement because I take your point, Professor Moon, that you know civil society has you could see this like gradual sort of progression of our engagement. So um, at least externally, um, so really take that point. And I would just say that there is a bit more movement around including lower and middle income countries now. But again, in the absence of like a formalized structure that has these key components, the ones that we've talked about, the ones you've talked about, it is really difficult to see that. Um, and it was a very big surprise to me in your slides, Professor Moon, um, when that uh, graphic around who was in the Facilitation Council was released earlier this year to find my organization's name there. <laughs> I didn't know that we were considered a part of the Facilitation Council and a lead in one of the pillars. That was not something that was discussed or formally agreed to. So it's an interesting uh, process and it's an interesting grouping to be a part of. Great, thanks, Katie. So thinking constructively, uh, drawing together some of the themes that uh, have emerged in this discussion, what is this notion of emergency and urgency? Uh, and uh, I think uh, this uh, protracted nature of this pandemic has surprised pretty much everybody. Uh, do you think it's time now to sort of and, and picking up on 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 Professor Moon's point about the uh, huge amount of public funding going in and how it dwarfs actually extant organizations? Uh, how do we navigate this tension between the stated uh, views of not having a formalized, uh, they wanted to be nimble and responsive to uh, an emerging and er, uh, emergent situation, and actually that need for, I think, a little bit more substantive clarity around accountability, uh, because there is so much uh, at stake here. How do we constructively, if, I, if you were to be uh, invited to address the facilitation council to constructively move this forward, uh, how would, which, what would each of you say uh, are the immediate next steps to improve the governance? I'm gonna start with Suri, then go to Katie and then to Owen. Katie, or pardon me, Suri, sorry. sorry. I get the least thinking time. <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I think for me, one of It's the... an emergency, Suri. <laughs> I will be quick. No, uh, one of the things that I think we can take away from from uh, political theory is this notion of um, uh, deliberative democracy, and and I don't want to get too too abstract or nerdy about this, but it's the idea that at some Sometimes at the international level, you cannot always have everybody represented. You cannot necessarily have the same types of governance mechanisms as you might have at the national level. And we, we recognize that. And one way to try to counterbalance the, the weaknesses is by opening up the space for deliberation, for debate. And this is why one of our uh, conclusions in the article was to create such a forum. And I'm glad um, that... Uh, uh, Ms. Wright mentioned that the Facilitation Council is indeed uh, live streamed. I think that is an important step. Um, uh, but of course, you can't necessarily participate in, not everybody is allowed to participate, you can you can listen. Um, so there are these important steps being taken to, to move forward. Um, but I think there, there's a lot more that can be done. And I think part of, of enabling deliberative democracy is not only creation of a forum, but of course, access to information. And this is why there is so much emphasis on transparency, on access to information, and that people do get frustrated when they only have 24 or 48 hours to, you know, read and, and respond um, to, to documents. I think access to information is, again, an area, as I mentioned, where we've seen uh, progress, where we've seen more and more information being made available, and I'm, I'm confident that can continue. But that's part of deliberative democracy. And I think we have to see these as not nice to haves, not in peacetime, it would be great to have them. We have to see this as something that is essential. And that can be done today, certainly two years really into uh, a pandemic, about you know, more than 18 months since the, the accelerator itself was launched. And I, and I do think that 
addressing some of the governance weaknesses is important for building confidence in future efforts and in international cooperation. We have to um, move the needle on broader reforms. Uh, and if we're not able to make short term reforms, I'm not sure why a number of stakeholders would have confidence that we can make some of the harder and more deep seated structural reforms that are needed to really uh, strengthen our preparedness for future uh, for future crises. Great, thanks, Suri. Katie, your thoughts? I think it's a little late for just one next step. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, again, I go back to the, the initial set of decisions around the Act A was that it was going to be a limited term 12 to 18 month engagement. And the pandemic has, you know, overtaken us and defined that. For us as civil society and advocates, we're like, we're at a loss frankly, on how to do a lot of this and how to move a lot of this forward in a meaningful and also kind of quick way, because we aren't in the same rooms, right? Those live street facilitation councils are great, but we are never in the same rooms as people. We can never get them face to face and actually move a conversation forward. And that's really challenging. And I understand like, you know, COVID and there's a reason for that, but it is very challenging to move conversations forward. Um, I believe that, you know, when that first started, the, the main principal actors in ACT Day were fully seized um, at the moment and for those first 12 months and are still frankly quite fully seized with the work of the ACT Accelerator. It's I don't think a stretch to imagine that for most of those co-lead organizations this has broadly taken over everything that they do. It has a huge impact in terms of the work that their own organizations have been able to do and what their focuses are and where their discussions have been. And I say that to say who else in the space, like where were the others within the global health space to step in and while these actors were engaged and seized fully of this initial sort of meant to be term limited act a kind of setup, where was everybody else saying, you know, okay, but let's work towards a different structure or something better for the next time or something that can be implemented if those goes along. There was a sincere kind of lack of, maybe it was uh, just too challenging for individuals to see it. And so it didn't translate into organizational principles of looking long-term at COVID, not just the next pandemic, but how do we make this pandemic as short as possible, right? There was a sort of, and so where were the other actors? Who were some of the actors that could have taken that up? I mean, I think the WHO had a number of challenges um, in this time period, but you know, there are, you know, there's the, oh gosh, I'm terrible at acronyms these days, but um, the, the Global Action Plan for Health um, you know, there was a number of different, a number of different spaces that could have kind of taken that on so that if COVID wasn't done in 12 or 18 months, as the ACT Accelerator had initially predicted and hoped, I guess, what would come next and, and fill some of those spaces? Because frankly, it's past time for all of the kinds of recommendations that Professor Moon, uh, Dr. Schaefer, that we ourselves have called for and that many other actors have called for. It's past time for all of those. So I can't pick just one, but a, a consultative, deliberative, uh, two-way kind of conversation at least where it's not just sort of live streamed and you're listening in, that's at least a good start. Great, thanks. Uh, Owen, any thoughts on this topic? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think um, Katie and Suri have covered a lot of important ground and the Lancet paper has, you know, kind of a number of recommendations. I guess I'll just say, thinking about pandemic preparedness and the next time it was mentioned, there is this kind of move towards, you know, trying to generate you know, work towards international treaty uh, for uh, pandemic preparedness. And I think it is useful, it is very crucial actually that these considerations be thought up well in advance, you know, given that we will have a much longer runway, we won't have the excuse of saying, well, everything's rushed, you know, but we have, you know, um, it sounds like, I guess, from what Katie was saying, a couple of years to iron out those details as a matter of international negotiation. I hope these governance principles will be front, uh, first and foremost in um, whatever sort of the outcome is of that process. I guess I'll just say, I think that, you know, my, my own view, you know, I, I don't know about those views, is that the kind of decentralized model, ultimately a lot of, I think, governance uh, problems stem from that, right? Issues of accountability because uh, decision-making is decentralized, is issues of transparency because different entities have different transparency policies, um, and, and, and then issues of engagement because, again, engagement is devolved oftentimes to individual organizations rather than centrally uh, promoted. So I, I, so I guess, yeah, my own view is that um, uh, for this kind of long-term uh, pandemic preparedness that uh, move towards uh, centralized um, uh, decision-making and centralized uh, coordination for uh, 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 future uh, access to COVID-19, oh, sorry, future pandemic uh, tools is, is pushed. Okay, over. Thank you. So we're getting close to time and in reverse order, I'll ask uh, for some final concluding comments. And 
as ostensibly the focus of this uh, seminar series is on ethics and epidemics, uh, maybe in your final comments, you can raise uh, either a future research question or maybe point to something that ethics has missed thus far uh, in the discussion. So uh, Katie, this time I'm going to you first, which means Surrey has more thinking time and uh, uh, Owen will have the last word. So over to you, Katie, please. I mean, I really feel that it would be helpful if these kinds of conversations did continue to take place in a very active and central way um, as we, um, you know, do have those conversations on the global stage towards sort of what comes next. I don't think we can give up on ACT Day just yet. I'm not saying that, but I do feel like more active engagement from um, ethicists, from, you know, governance and accountability experts um, to do the to have these conversations faster and earlier so that we do this along the continuum of developing whatever that treaty ends up taking you know shape as it's a little unclear there seem to be a lot of different efforts so that's what i would say is just you know sort of keep these conversations going and keep trying to make sure that there's space for these conversations and space for external experts um, to bring the lessons from act day into the conversations of what comes next but i'm you know i'm not an ethicist and i'm not an academic and i'm not a researcher an accountability or governance expert but all i know about ethics is it's it's unwritten rules as much as it is written rules and the unwritten rules in this situation it is very clear that there is something a little bit rotten at the core and we need to do a little bit better as a global community um, to make sure that we can fix some of those challenges and address them more head on right from the beginning of both the next sort of pandemic response sort of framing but also so that hopefully we can do better as we try to bring this one to a close in a more timely way than it seems like we're set to do Great, thank you, Katie. Uh, Suri, your thoughts, please. Thanks very much. I'm also not a, an ethicist. Um, and, and I think for me, one of the key questions that I would love to have more, more input on from the ethics community is how do you create uh, arrangements and institutions that embody ethical values so that we're not only talking about um, you know, this is the ethical way to behave, but actually we construct our decision making processes to actually embody those. Um, and, and I take also very much the point that Katie Wright just made that it's, it's not just those rules, but it's also very much what's what's unwritten. And I, and I think that those who have spoken up in a critical way uh, to raise a number of these concerns have been very courageous in doing so, and that at our group, I think, relied on um, on uh, on civil society groups. You know, the letters that you saw, we relied on on journalists as well as you know internal contacts as well as the public documents to help us to make sense of what was happening. Um, and and surely we we've not captured everything. I mean, you never can. But um, I do think encouraging those who, you know, sometimes at, at, at professional uh, risk, you know, spoke up in a critical way um, about a large scale initiative. Um, I, I think this is important for exposing to the world some of the unwritten um, processes about which outsiders may not have such a clear picture. Uh, and perhaps this is also an important part of ethical um, ethical conduct or ethical governance is the, the willingness to, to speak up and uh, uh, to speak out. Thanks. And uh, Owen, as the card carrying ethicist of this uh, discussion, over to you for uh, last word. Thanks. I, mean, I don't know how much uh, how much you know being eth being an ethicist really you know matters here. I, I'll actually say the thing that bothers me most or that concerns me most is not the ethical framework or the ethical underpinnings, but the pragmatism um, and the political realism of being able to actually uh, instantiate those ethical ideals of governance in the real world. Because you know um, one thing we didn't talk about too much is that one one, one unspoken barrier to realizing these are going to be you know political realities, vested interests um, among um, entities that have more political power and more monetary power, talking about funding, for example. So I, I guess I don't have an answer for this, but it is a concern about how to balance this. And to what extent, you know, are we going to have to think about compromise when you talk about, well, if we're going to, you know, when you're forming a treaty and negotiating on treaty, you need to get signatures, right? You need to get countries on board. And, and to what extent are we going to have to compromise to some extent um, on these ethical ideals? And to what extent is that going to, you know, um, you know imperil the ability of 
uh, any kind of future organizations to respond uh, to pandemics. So I, I am cognizant of that of that trade off, um, and I think you know it's something that. Um, that, that you know you need to you need to be, be realistic about what you can achieve because the risk is if you end up pr pr promoting the ideals too strongly then you might end up with nothing if if it's not matching um, uh, what relevant uh, players are willing to accept. That having been said, um, I think you know uh, we what ethicists can continue to do is at least to put forward this um, you know the ethical ideal of good governance um, as a, a backdrop and a, as a, a kind of starting point um, from which to to begin negotiations and to, and to work from there pragmatically. Okay, over. Thank you, Owen. So uh, we're at time. There's still some questions in the Q&A, and we will try to get uh, back to those uh, uh, through uh, the Epidemics Ethics Network. So I'd like to thank uh, Katie, uh, Suri, and Owen for a fabulous discussion. I think we only uh, very much uh, scratched the surface. Uh, and uh, perhaps we can come back to this again in the future, uh, because obviously uh, the pandemic's not going anywhere soon, nor is there issues around governance. And you know the whole idea around ethics ethics or normative discourse is how values actually animate, shape our responses. And those values can be political as well as, uh, you know, from ethical uh, uh, sources. So that's a, a good way of uh, thinking how we need transdisciplinary approaches to work on this. So I'd like to thank the attendees and participants as well for joining us and remind you that uh, this recording will be up on the Epidemics Ethics website soon. I invite all the participants to uh, regularly visit uh, the uh, uh, website uh, for the exciting slate that will be coming out in 2022 and to follow Epidemic Ethics on Twitter. And so with that, I will call this uh, uh, meeting to a close with great thanks to all. Once again, Katie, Suri, and Owen, fabulous discussion. I think we only just got it started, but at least we were having a, a small model of how one can create a deliberation uh, where people take each other's uh, uh, comments seriously and to heart. So everybody keep well, uh, be well, and enjoy the holiday if you celebrate, and uh, we will see you next year. Bye-bye.